Today we're gonna to talk about cooling for your CPU and a lot of the things that people tend to get wrong. Specifically, we're gonna talk about the difference between TDP and actual heat generated by your CPU so you can stop undersizing your coolers and start buying the right ones the first time. Introducing the XTM3 from Fantex, micro ATX chassis built for power and performance. Compact yet packed with potential, the XTM3 features support for rear connect motherboards, dedicated radiator space at the top, and triple fan locations at the bottom to help keep your GPU cool. With its innovative layout and sleek, clean design, the XTM3 is ready to take on almost any gaming PC configuration and cooling challenge. Check out the link in the description for more details. So the confusion here comes between the difference between TDP or thermal design power and actual heat generated by the part. Now, the CPU manufacturers like Intel and AMD, they're really the only two that matter in our space. I mean, yeah, there's ARM and Apple and all that crap. But we're just about to talk about the two that are relevant for us. Uh, they'll give a TDP on the one sheet when it comes to the CPU. For instance, the 9950X and the 7950X and the X3Ds are a 170 watt part. However, anyone that has those CPUs and loads up a full torture test knows they go beyond that. The PPT, which is referred to on AMD, or the like total power that's allowed to be drawn by the CPU, can go quite a bit higher than that. Now, watts consumed is not the same as watts in heat generated. So you gotta understand, the heat that's generated is always higher than the actual wattage of the TDP or the thermal design power of the CPU. Let me back up here and give you an example. My, my 9950X3D is 170 watt part. At stock speeds, without enabling PBO or anything like that, it easily draws up to about 220 to 230 watts of power. That, or that, so that's, that's already right there, putting it pretty close to Intel's 253 watt, which everyone kind of makes fun of. Let's not forget Intel was also pushing itself to over 330 watts, but I digress, that's neither here nor there. The point is, if you were to pair a 9950X3D with a cooler that maybe has 150 watts or 180 watts on the box, you would quickly find that although the cooler would probably be able to keep the CPU fairly cool uh, for the first while of load, that while depending on many factors, the ambient temperature in your room, the fan speeds on your fan, the overall exchange rate of your case, there's a lot of things that play in, tie in here to overall cooling, but you would find over time, you would probably start hitting your TJ Maxx because the cooler over time would be overpowered by the amount of heat being generated by the CPU if it is under spec. Now here's the somewhat non forthcoming part that a lot of people don't realize. The TDP when it comes to the CPUs is basically the thermal design power based on normal usage for base clocks. You might not understand, none of your CPUs are running at base clock. In fact, the Intel 14900K has a 125 watt TDP at base clock. So it looks good on paper to say, hey, we've got a 125 watt part. It'll never run 125 watts because it will automatically want to go up to Intel's default profile or you know, power PL1 or power level one is set to 253 watts in the BIOS. So unless you're gonna go in and disable all of the boost that's built into your CPU, which by the way is all on by default, significantly, it, it's pulling more than double that at 253 watts. So if you were to just look at the specs on paper and say, well, I, you know, this is a 100 watt, be quiet, low profile cooler right here. You might look at this and go, well, that's only 25 watts shy. Maybe if I undervolt a little bit, I can get away with it. No, you can't. As many of you probably already realized on your own, if you get a cooler that is under spec for your CPU and you start under volting, you're gonna start losing clock speed with it too because clock and voltage and wattage are all, like they, they're, they all work in harmony with each other. So to get the full clock speed, you need the full power limit available to it in its boost or tau or turbo time. Like all of these factors that are built into CPUs now all have to be met to get the full advertised speeds. So you've got a base speed, which none of the brands really like advertise heavily or are all that proud of, but you've got your boost speeds, which are up to overclocks, which are automatic overclocks over base clock. And that is where the TDP numbers that you didn't see on paper can basically just be thrown out the window. Now the same thing happens with GPUs, although most people are not going out there and changing out their GPU coolers, although you used to be able to do that back in the day. You could buy some third party GPU coolers. You could slap on a Nvidia or AMD graphics card, increase your cooling. That was before GPU boost was really a thing. So you kind of gained lower temperatures for manual overclocking, but now that GPUs automatically overclock is why you see these really big beefy coolers on there because the cooler you can keep it, the higher you can keep the sustained speeds. The same thing 
for your CPUs. But it's important to note though, TDP of the CPU can easily be two to three times what's on the box in terms of the TDP rating, depending on various conditions. Now, here are some examples here. We've got the 14900K at 125 watt, but realistically it pulls between 250 and 300, depending on your microcode, depending on your board BIOS, and depending on your cooling. The problem was, when it comes to degradation, the CPUs were allowed to pull more than that 253, which is requiring more voltage to do it, which led to very premature, premature degradation as we all know now. But 175 watt Ryzen 9 9950X3, or 9950X is 170 watt TDP, but it realistically pulls 230 watts. And that's because of precision boost. Precision boost is, is just an automatic boost, you know, up to, that's why those up to numbers are there. Uh, the 7800X3D, it's a 120 watt part. That one's actually pretty kind of pretty cool though, because it really does pull around 120 watts. So that's why the 9800X3D and the 9800s are pretty easy to like keep cool because they're staying within the, the number that's listed on the package. But here's the crazy part. The Intel i5-13600K, a mid-tier part, was decent for gaming, had some overclock and unlockability to it has a 125 watt part also. Do you, do you see the trend here? How can it be 125 watts if the 14900K is also 125 watts? But in real world scenarios, it still pulls between 180 and 200 watts when it comes to cooling. So that means you might even be building yourself an SFF PC or a small form factor, travel build or whatever, and you're like, well, it's only a 13.6. It shouldn't need that much cooling. You get a small low profile cooler like this and you put it in like a fractal Terra or something and then you find that even a mid-tier part is starting to cook itself and throttle down because of the fact that its cooling is not capable uh, because you saw one number and didn't understand the realistic number here. Now let's talk about some, I'll give you some tiers of cooling here and kind of where they tend to line up. Uh, for instance, low profile coolers like this, like I said, this one's listed at 100 watts. Realistically, they're like 95 watts and down. They're really only gonna be good, good for cooling something like a 7600X or a 9700X or 9600X or like a 13400F, something like that. Something that doesn't have auto overclocking, something that has much lower uh, frequency headroom available to it, doesn't have like precision boost. It's gonna push it well into the, you know, high five gigahertz range. It's really limited on what it's capable of doing. So obviously you put a tiny cooler like that on your CPU, you are not going to have the most, you know, exciting time when it comes to your cooling numbers, but if you keep your overclocks off and you don't let it boost as high, it could probably get the job done in some small form factor builds. That's, you would only use something like this where space is extremely limited. Um, this one right here doesn't actually have any heat pipes on it. Noctua has a really nice low profile cooler that has three or four heat pipes and it's, I think they're up to like 150 watts now on some of their, their smaller uh, coolers. But Noctua is a whole nother discussion. They don't even conform or use to normal TDP numbers when it comes to cooling capabilities or cooling, cooling dissipation or heat dissipation. They use their own factors and their own numbers, which doesn't really translate directly to any of the ways that we understand CPU heat and the way the heat's generated. So good luck actually factoring all that in to try and figure out where they really land. But a single tower cooler, like the Hyper 212 I have right here, which is legendary from Cooler Master. This thing has been around for like 20 years and gone through, I don't know how many different revisions, but it's one of those, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's got four direct uh, copper heat pipes, doesn't even have a vapor chamber, but it tends to usually get the job done. If I look on the box right here with my old eyes, let's see if it has a, a cooling number on here. Uh, nope, doesn't actually have a cooling figure on here. And the reason why the Hyper 212 has been so legendary is because the 212 actually stands for the original cooling capability of it, which is approximately 212 watts of heat, which is so much higher than anything that was really being generated at the era. If you remember our, our retro gaming series we've been working through, our Pentium 4, 2.4 gigahertz, 512K, 533 FSB. <laughs> I have to point that out because there's so many P4 SKUs, uh, is a 92 watt CPU. So this would absolutely dominate. In fact, I should hang on to this because I got a retro build that we're doing with a CPU that pulls quite a bit more power. And I think I'm gonna end up using this guy here because it is an LGA 775. No, sorry, it's an LGA 1366. 
and they still support it. So I think I'm gonna cheat and use this 212, which I've never used. But anyway, single air tower, single fans like this are good for about 150 to 180 watts, or if you're Cooler Master, up to about 212. So it's really good for like Ryzen 7 models, maybe Ryzen 9 models that, are, that you're not pushing the overclocks on, or maybe you go in and do an undervolt on. Because remember, volts directly relates to heat because amps times volts equals watts and vice versa. You can flip the algorithm or that formula around however you want. They'll always equal each other, just like watts divided by volts equals amps. So you get all those numbers. But anyway, um, this would be very capable of, of cooling the CPU that we've got and most modern CPUs, as long as you're not trying to overclock. And if you can reduce the voltage through a voltage offset, that reduces heat load and power demand just as much, uh, which would help. Now, dual towers like the NHD 15 or in this one here, the Dark Rock Pro 4 Pro, uh, these are dual towers, which as you can see, easily double, almost double the amount of cooling, although they're a shared heat pipe system. This one happens to be a vapor chamber. Fun fact, if you wanna know how to tell the difference between whether or not it has a vapor chamber or it's just a direct contact copper heat pipe, Look at the base. If the base is smooth and the heat pipe is running through it, it is more than likely going to be a vapor chamber. However, if you can see the pipe where it's been like ground flat and then you can see it, obviously the copper running straight across, that's a direct contact copper heat pipe, which is not a vapor chamber. They're, they're, they were definitely ahead of their time when they were new, but they're kind of behind the times today where vapor chambers have a much faster wicking of heat through uh, the, obviously the vapor chamber and the, the wicking material to pull the heat away from the source faster. Um, vapor chambers are definitely going to be more sought after. But a dual tower like this, and apparently my CPU didn't get the memo here, it's fans ramping up, all this talk about cooling, it's, anyway. Uh, dual towers like this are good, usually for anywhere between 220 watts to 250 watts. In fact, if you look at like the, the Dark Rock 4 Pro, or Dark Rock Pro 4, whatever the number is, it even says 250 watts right on the box. I think some of the bigger ones, it is ramping up even more, what the heck? Anyway, it's just sitting here on a document that I wrote, <laughs> anyway. Okay, good job, uh, what it's Origin. Intel says that CPU's 45 watts, quote unquote. Base clock. <laughs> anyway, this has got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven heat pipes. Uh, there are about five millimeter pipes on this. Um, and I can actually find these cooling up to 300 watts now, which is like at a minimum what you would need for like an i9 or a Ryzen 9, because like we talked about, those can easily hit 230 to 250 plus watts out of the box without doing anything. Now, obviously that depends on your workload. If you're not, if you're just going through and doing gaming and such like that, then you're never gonna hit the max cooling that's necessary. But it's nice to make sure you can keep your CPU cool if you decide to start doing things. You decide you, you, decide you wanna start live streaming or editing videos or whatever. Why, why have to run out and buy another cooler, right? It's more expensive to buy a cooler and then decide later it doesn't work for you and have to go buy another cooler. It's cheaper to just buy the bigger cooler at the start and call it a day. But these are good for, like I said, up to about uh, 250 watts. Now, let's talk about AIOs. This is where the conversation really starts to lead to like, well, a really good dual tower cooler is just as good as an AIO. Well, the crossover tends to be usually on nice dual tower coolers like the HD15 or the Dark Rock Pro. Uh, at about 250 watts is where a 240 millimeter AIO is generally capable of cooling. So that's where they kind of intersect. Now. No cooling tower is gonna to be as good as say a 280 millimeter AIO or a 360 AIO, or in this instance, a 420 millimeter AIO. As the radiator gets bigger, the thermal capacity of the system grows quite a bit. Now there's a, there's a logarithmic formula there that you could look at if you want it, but again, they're all affected by many factors. The fan speed, the fan pressure, the CFM of the fan, the cooling capability of your case and the ambient temperature of the room at which the CPU or the PC is in. All of those things create an envelope within an envelope within an envelope that all have to be considered when it comes to cooling. Now, AIOs tend to be one of those points where people sometimes aren't comfortable with it because they have a much higher chance of having a failure because of the moving parts in it, right? You've got fluid, which can age or start to corrode over time. Some AIO brands have had a really bad job at making sure they had good anti-corrosives. Um, there are aluminum radiators with a copper heat plate. So they're mixed metals, which means even though you can use proper fluid to make sure that galvanic corrosion is not accelerated, it's still gonna happen over time and eventually they do wear out. Um, the pump can stop working. Obviously you could spring a leak, which makes a lot of people worried. Although when's the last time you really heard about an AIO leaking? It's not super common. 
Uh, they just have more moving parts that can fail. Obviously, um, the evaporation through the tubing is something that can happen, so they start to gain air over time, which is why AIO brands have started adding refill ports so you can top it off, get more life out of it. The only moving part on a cooler is the fan. And if the fan goes bad and stops working, guess what? Your CPU doesn't immediately skyrocket to temperatures and do a thermal shutdown because non-moving of fluid means a runaway on temperature. There's still passive cooling that can happen and you have you may not even notice your CPU is not work or your fan's not working for a while. Um, the only moving parts is the fans and those are easy and cheap to replace if necessary. But a 360 AIO can easily cool up to 320 watts and then a 420 and custom loops can easily cool up to 400 plus watts. So as you can see, it can obviously scale up. So if you're trying to buy like a high-end CPU, like an i9 or a Ryzen 9, then the only way you're gonna be able to really push the limits of the CPU, get the full clock speed sustained and not have those drop over time is to overbuild your cooling, which is never a bad thing. You can never have too much cooling, but you can definitely have too little. It's kind of like thermal paste. Uh, with given the fact that you can buy 360 millimeter AIOs for under $100 from reputable brands, I mean, realistically more like 65, 70 bucks, I think it's worth to just buy two or three of those and have some spare ones on the shelf, to be honest, because look at how much an NHD 15 is. They are not cheap. These are like, those are like $200 air coolers, right? If you can buy three 360 AIOs from like Thermal Right for less than that, just do that, I guess. Then you have spare parts and a spare AIO and they're easy to swap out. Just don't get confused about TDP. That's something that so many people still get wrong these days is they, they look at the TDP and they're kind of caught in this, this marketing war where brands want to quote, like peg themselves as being the most efficient, but that's because they're only comparing base clocks and that's not realistic. That's not real world scenario. The CPU never runs at base clock unless it is throttled itself down to there, which means something is obviously really wrong. Uh, anyway, I just wanna kind of have this discussion here. I still see a lot of people uh, get really confused about how much cooling they need. Let's just run down a couple of CPUs real quick. Like the AMD 7600 non-X is a 65 watt part, but that still pulls 90 watts uh, realistically under sustained load. Uh, the Ryzen 5 7600, 7600X is a 105 watt part that can pull up to 130 watts. 7700X, 105 watts up to 140 watts. And then 7800X 3D is a 120 watt part that runs at 120. It's like the only part that actually runs at its advertised speed. And you know why? Because of the 3D V cache and the sensitivities regarding 7000 series and how it was inverted. And the cache was touching the IHS, not the core. So they definitely didn't have headroom available to them. But the 9000 series does. So that's why we see the 9000 series X3D CPUs for the dual CCDs go higher from 125 watt, uh, or excuse me, 170 watt base up to a realistic 230 watts under sustained load. Anyway, that's where you kind of kind of, that's where you have to kind of ask yourself like what are you doing with your with your system? If you're just building a gaming rig and you know you're not going to be doing anything else besides gaming, you could more than likely get away with a big air tower cooler like this on any build and be just fine. What you're going to notice it though is if you start doing anything that really tortures the CPU and is extremely CPU heavy. But fortunately, most creative suites these days offload all of that encoding onto the GPU anyway. So it, it's not really a huge issue, but uh, I see so many arguments and conversations take place regarding like, well, good tower coolers are just as good as an AIO and vice versa. And a lot of that's true, but I think we've seen with the CPU wars taking place over the last you know decade, and especially over the last five years, we've seen CPU efficiency just get thrown out the window for the sake of bragging rights. And now it's showing up when it comes to uh, inefficiencies on modern coolers or an underspec cooler. All right, guys, thanks for watching. I uh, hope you've learned something today. Share this video with someone you think it might help or anyone you've been having this discussion with. And as always, we'll make more videos like this regarding the stuff we see you guys asking and talking about. We'll see you in the next one.